uh, and it has, in a lot of cases, spiritual ramifications. And this is what we want to talk about tonight. So I want to call your attention to the Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter number 16. And we're going to deal with verse number 1 through 4. The Gospel according to St. Matthew, chapter 16, and verse 1 through 4. And I'm going to be reading an article to you, a portion of an article uh, that's relative to what we will be dealing with, praise the Lord, on tonight. Amen. It's good to see everyone tonight. We hope that many are recovering from uh, the virus that's out there. Amen. I'm praying for you, those that are still suffering, and staying away from you at the same time. Hallelujah. <laughs> God bless you. So pray for Brother Cedric. He tore his ACL, uh, and um, he has to have surgery. Uh, but he's still giving God the glory. So continue to pray for him. A lot going on, isn't it? Amen. But the Lord is still in charge. So uh, keep him in your prayer and keep also Sister Jeffries in prayer. They postponed her surgery. Uh, and so we want you to um, pray uh, for her. We have a lot to pray for around here, don't we? We need to make sure we are busy praying all the time. All right. Matthew chapter 16. And let's read verse 1 through 4, and then we'll go back over it, all right? Um, I appreciate those that are here tonight that we're here in day Bible class. Amen. It shows your love, your serious love for the Word, and we appreciate that. God bless you tonight. Um, let's read verse 1. The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired him that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning, it will be foul weather today, for the sky is red and lowering. O ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the signs of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall no sign be given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas, and he left them and departed. Now, our subject is uh, discerning the signs of the times. Now, the Pharisees were a religious sect, S-E-C-T, that came about during what is called the 400 years of silence. The 400 years of silence is the period from the prophet Malachi to John the Baptist. And the reason why it was called the 400 years of silence is because God did not speak to the nation of Israel during that time. Heaven was silent to the nation of Israel. And so this is what is called the 400 years of silence. Now. Thank you. During this time, during that period, uh, we must realize that the uh, religious group called the Pharisees uh, got started. The Pharisees were a religious group that boasted to know the law of God, and they were the teachers of the people at that time. And it was during that 400 years that synagogues were erected. Synagogues were special places where the Jews gathered together to hear and to be taught the law. And by the time Jesus had come, which was 400 years later, there were 1,000 synagogues in Palestine alone. And in each synagogue, there were 24 teachers. So we then conclude then that at the time that Jesus came, there were 24,000 teachers of the law in that day, and not one of them were qualified to teach anybody. Because the scripture says when Jesus came and he looked at on the multitudes, he was moved with compassion because they were as sheep without a shepherd. 24,000 teachers of the word of God, of the law, 
and not one of them were qualified to teach or to lead anybody. Sounds like a whole lot of that going on today. Is that right? <laughs> so the thing of it is, is that the Pharisees, they believed in a resurrection and angels and spirits, uh, but they fancied themselves as the most spiritual people that they were, but they were actually hypocrites. They looked good on the outside, but on the inside, they were very hypocritical. Now, the Sadducees, which was another religious sect, they did not believe in the resurrection angel nor spirit. So these were religious groups that Jesus had the most problems out of because they saw him as a threat to them because they were doing pretty good uh, at making money off of the people of God and, and they considered themselves authoritarians on the scriptures. But when Jesus came along, he taught them as one having authority and not as the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes. And he had a lot of people that were listening to him and following him. And these religious groups felt threatened by him. And they were the ones that were responsible chiefly for him being betrayed uh, and crucified. They had a hand in it. And so when Jesus came, uh, they attacked him and tempted him. And so God had not spoken to the nation for 400 years. And that's why when John the Baptist came along and uh, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, they asked him, were you the Messiah? And he said, no, I'm not that Messiah. I'm not the light. I'm the voice crying in the wilderness. I'm the one preparing the way for the Messiah. But when the Messiah finally came, they did not receive him as their Messiah because Israel thought that their Messiah was going to be a political Messiah, meaning that he would overthrow the Roman Empire because they were under the oppression of the Romans and reestablish the nation of Israel as a kingdom once again. But that's not why he came. He came seeking and to save that which was lost. He came to give his life a ransom for many. So while he was ministering, preaching and teaching and doing all the miracles, they understood that he claimed that he was claiming to be the Messiah, the Son of God, and a lot of people uh, were following him. And so they asked him, tempting him, show us a sign from heaven. If you are all that you say you are, prove to us who you are. Now they did this tempting him. And now let's look at verse number two. He answered and said unto them, when it is evening, you say it will be fair weather, for the sky is red. In the morning, it will be foul weather. And today, for the sky is red and lowering. You can tell when the weather is going to be cold or warm or what type of weather it's going to be by being able to discern by looking at the sky. And he said, you are hypocrites because you can discern the face of the sky, but you can't discern the signs of the times. In other words, you boast yourself as to know the scriptures. You boast of yourself as knowing the law, the Old Testament laws of God. And you are such a hypocrite that you can't even discern the fact that I am the Messiah, that I am the one, that those scriptures that you think that you know are the ones that are talking about me, that I am here, and therefore you need to repent and turn and receive me so that you can be saved. That's why he called them hypocrites, because they portrayed to be one thing. They, if they were as spiritual and as righteous as they claimed to be, then when he came, they would have readily accepted him as the Messiah. But he came to his own, and his own what? Received him not. So they were hypocrites because they were claiming to be close to God, but then God himself comes, and they couldn't even recognize who he was. And there's a lot of that that goes on today. You have people that claim to be saved and claim to be knowing God, but they don't want to be part of a local church. They claim to be children of God, but they don't want to pay tithes. They claim to be children of God, but they can't get along with anybody. They claim that they're saved, but they won't live right. What are they? Hypocrites. <laughs> Can you say amen? And so he criticized them that you're supposed to have all this discernment, but you can't even tell who I am 
when I'm fulfilling miracles and the scriptures that you teach and know prophesy that the Messiah would be working miracles. Remember he said in Isaiah 61, I believe it is, where the prophet Isaiah prophesied 600 years before Jesus came, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, for he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, the recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. They knew those scriptures. And when he came and was doing those things, they should have been able to say, here he is. Here's the one we've been waiting for since the Garden of Eden. If they were as righteous as they proclaimed themselves to be, if they were as saved as they claimed themselves to be, if they knew God as they claimed that they did, but they did not. They portray that they did, but they didn't. So in other words, give us another sign that will satisfy us tempting him. And he called them a wicked and adulterous generation. Can we say amen? Now, what we want to talk about is discerning the signs of the times. Now, we all know that our president, Donald Trump, uh, passed the um, tax law. Is that right? And, of course, they are hailing that this tax law uh, is going to um, uh, pretty much um, give us tax breaks uh, and all these things. Um, but it is basically a smokescreen. Now, the reason why we're dealing with this is because we're dealing with the signs of the times. Our national debt is $20 trillion dollars. And the United States pay at least $250 billion in interest. These are monies that the government owes. And we spend as a nation more than what we take in. Now, in your home, if your bills are more than the money you have coming in, what's going to happen? You're going to come to financial ruin. Is that right? <clears throat> and the government is the worst money manager that could ever be because this country spends more than what they take in. And I'm going to read you this article here um, about what's going on uh, in our world concerning the national debt. Now, um, the national debt is what the United States owes. We owe China uh, over a trillion dollars. And the United States pretty much borrows money every day to run the country. And so um, um, when Bush took over, the national debt was like six trillion dollars. When he got done, uh, the national debt uh, was over 10 trillion. So he, well, should I say, um, it was, I think it was, yeah, 6 trillion, but he raised the national debt another 60%. So I think it came to like, um, um, I think it was like 6 trillion, and when he got done, it was over 12, somewhere around there. So he raised, and it was because of 9 11 and all those type of things. When Obama took over, and of course, Bush raised the national debt over an eight-year period to 60% of what was left when Clinton left office. And when Obama took over in the eight years that he was here, he caused the national debt to rise another $6 trillion. Now, Trump has been in office for a year, and he's already raised it. 1.5 trillion. He's just getting started. Now, why is this important? Because what this is showing is that the scriptures are going to be fulfilled because this economy, society, economically is going to collapse. And this world is going to go into a famine of such that they have never seen before. And we're going to show you that uh, by the scriptures. And so I want to read you this article, and I read the article uh, earlier today, um, 
to the day Bible class and of course trying to find uh, this article that I had. The U.S. debt is 20 trillion. Most headlines focus on how much the United States owes China, one of the largest foreign owners. What many people don't know is that the Social Security Trust Fund, your retirement money, owns most of the national debt, which simply means that those of us that are retired and on Social Security, um, that money is paid out of a trust fund that contributes to the national debt. You see, a lot of people think that when you pay Social Security while you're working, that you are paying into your own Social Security when you retire. That's not true. When we are working and we pay Social Security, we are paying for those that are already retired and that are already on Social Security. That's how that works. And so, uh, when we retired, like I paid into Social Security for 26 years, and my Social Security money that they took out of my check went into a trust fund that paid those that were already retired and on Social Security. And so now that I'm retired, those that are working, they take Social Security out and they put it into a fund that pays the 60 million people of us that are retired or are getting Social Security. And because of the debt has risen so high, and because the government has borrowed from the Social Security Trust Fund to help pay its bills, now where there used to be 30 workers that contributed to the payment of one retiree, it has now dwindled down to 2.9 people that pays every retiree. And it is shrinking and shrinking, and pretty soon, the debt is going to get so high that there will be no Social Security, that there will be no retirement, to where there will be no Medicaid. Can we say amen? So uh, this is where we are headed to. Now I'm trying to find this article that I read this morning, and I thought I saved it. Um, but keep in mind, um, as the country spends more and more money, it is causing um, our debt to rise, rise, and of course, we do not have the money coming in. We have more money going out than we have coming in. Now, let me read this article to you. The availability of credit in the United States was a major catalyst in the economic boom of the 20th century. Uh, however, too much of a good thing can also be a problem. Is the U.S. too reliant on debt? Is the federal government mortgaging the future earnings of an entire generation? In this article, we'll explore these and other issues as we take a look at the debt cycle in America. In the early part of the 20th century, if people didn't have the money to purchase an item, they would save for it. Is that right? With the introduction of credit terms, high dollar items became much more affordable. It also changed the way we view debt. For example, rather than think of a new car in terms of its total price, we began to focus on the amount of the monthly payments. Is that true? Can we say amen? And as the use of debt increased, the American standard of living rose with it because of our taking advantage of credit. Because you can get credit, you buy more things on credit, and instead of having to pay the whole total price up front, you pay a certain amount every month, which enabled us to get the new expensive car or the house or the high price items that we enjoy. You follow what we're saying? That's what credit has done, all right? Now, uh, that's how the American standard of living rose. Now, excessive debt was also one of the primary catalysts for the economic boom of the 80s and 90s and 2000s. You see, in the 1980s and the 90s and 2000s, the economy boomed. And a lot of people were making a lot of money. As a matter of fact, my pastor became a millionaire 
during those times. Uh, it is said that when Michael Jordan was playing basketball, that in his lifetime, he, because of Michael Jordan's fame and his name, 11 millionaires were made because of Michael Jordan's basketball career. That was in the 80s and in the 90s, 2000. That's just one example. However, when debt is used in excess, it steals from the future since it must be repaid. Now, our government, the Republicans, have just passed a tax reduction. They, to some degree, rewrote the tax code and they passed a tax law that would give us tax breaks, which means that we can claim more on our return and supposedly get us more money back. Now, the tax law that they revision that they did will benefit the rich and the super rich because what it did is that they were paying taxes on something like 35 percent and they re reduced their taxes down to the low 30s percent and because the idea of the government is that if you lower taxes then employers will hire more and it will boost the economy, but that has never been proven according to economics, uh, economists that study the economy, all right? Now, if you don't understand what we're saying, well, you, you, you'll figure it out here in a minute. So, when he and the Republicans uh, passed the tax law, what they did was that they're saying, we're gonna take less money from you now, if the debt is 20 trillion and constantly going up and the way you pay the debt is money from us, then if you take money from us then, or give us money back, then that debt is gonna what? Rise. Now, what they did is that they put, they given us breaks now that's gonna cost us in the end because if the tax, if the debt continues to rise, that means we're gonna owe more money and they're gonna to have to pay for that later on. So that's when he has reference to is that they are taking money from the future to benefit from us now, but that money's gotta be paid back. See, that's why I'm not big on getting loans and companies and stuff, because it's nice to have a nice car, but then you got to pay that money what? <laughs> Can we say amen? And so the tax breaks that he is giving us now, they're going to have to be paid back later on because the debt is continuing to what? Rise. And the Democrats and many of the, econ uh, the economists are trying to tell them this is not the way to do, but because they are so concerned, the rich are so concerned about getting more money, more money, more money, more money. They don't care about what it's going to cost us later on. You follow what we're saying? You say amen? Now, we'll show you what we're getting to now. So they are stealing from the future, but it's still got to be paid. And I tell you how they're going to pay it. Later on, if Jesus don't come, they're going to cut Medicaid. They're going to cut Social Security. They're going to cut retirement benefits. And already they're trying to, they, they done uh, uh, re peeled some of the things of Obamacare that's going to leave tens of millions of people without any health care. And many of our elderly are going to suffer from it. All right. Why is this? Because the rich want to get rich. The Bible says hell and destruction are never full. Therefore, the eyes of man are never satisfied. What does a rich person want more of? More riches at the expense of others. Now, I'm almost finished with this article. Um, however, when debt is used in excess, it steals from the future since it must be repaid. This is because a dollar borrowed today necessitates that a dollar plus interest be repaid in the future. This reduces the amount of money available for future spending if the amount of debt accumulated is significant and the period of accumulation is long. The required debt payments will negatively impact economic growth. What about government debt? How does it impact the future and the economy? Well, 
at the time of this writing, the debt was 18 trillion. Now it's 20 trillion. All right. Um, and uh, it's going to approach 21 trillion uh, by 2019. Actually, it's going to be higher than that because it's at 20 trillion right now. Now, let me give you this information and then we'll close on this. It says the chart below contains this data which shows how it has more than doubled over the past 11 years, rising from $72,051 per taxpayer in 2004 to $154,161 a day. In other words, that um, the average tax for us is $72,051 per taxpayer. That was in 2004. Now it has doubled to $154,161 today. Now, as the debt continues higher, the liability of every taxpayer is also rising. In other words, as the debt increases, the more taxes we're going to have to pay because they are going to have to pay that money some kind of way. All right? So... Um, this is what's going on now. I'm gonna give you another article here um, that I want you that I want to give you um, here. Uh, three ways to visualize the national debt. The def the national debt is the public debt owed by the federal government, and of course, as I read this here, the federal government adds to the debt whenever it spends more than it receives in tax revenue. Each year's budget deficit gets added to the debt. Each budget surplus gets subtracted from the Social Security Trust Fund. The debt should be compared to the nation's ability to pay it off. And of course, uh, we know that because when you go and apply for a loan, they want to look to see your ability to what? Pay it off. But see, this debt has got $20 trillion. We don't have enough money coming in to pay that debt. If the United States sold everything that they had, the gross domestic product, everything that we had, and we would not buy anything, that will still not pay all our bills. All right, now let me give you this here. The national debt is so large, it's hard to imagine. Here are three ways to visualize it. First, the national debt equals out to $60,000 for every man, woman, and child in the United States. That national debt is like every man, woman, and child in the United States say that the debt is likened to every man, woman, and child in the United States owing $60,000. Now, there's 320 million U.S. Americans in the United States. And, of course, the United States debt is the largest in the world. It's slightly greater than of the European Union, which consists of 28 countries. So the United States debt is larger than 28 countries combined. So what does all this mean? It means that we are headed to an economic collapse. The world economy is going to fall. And this is what the signs of the end times are. And it's going to fall because of men's greed. Can we say amen? Now, all of the things that are going on in this world, this world is heading for destruction. And we're going to show you some scripture in Revelation to show you that. This world is headed to destruction. All of the violence, all of the crime, all of the rape, all of the murder that's going on is nothing in comparison to what's coming because what's preventing the world from completely destroying itself is the church in the earth. I was watching a program on television. Uh, it's a program that deals with the issues that are in the state of Kentucky. And I saw a demographic there that showed that 70,000 children are in kin care. What's kin care? 
that is 70,000 children in Kentucky are being raised by grandparents. And I know that because I see them in here. 70,000 children being raised by their grandparents because the parents are either too irresponsible or on drugs or are locked up in prison. And so the grandparents, after they raise their own children, they got to raise some more children. And of course, they talked about how since uh, 2014, the, uh, there were 6,000 children in foster care. Now it's 8,000. I thought that was pretty low in comparison to the 70,000 children that are being raised in kin care or by their grandparents. Isn't that something? That is a terrible shame because of the type of world that we're living in. Now, I want to show you this here, that um, this world is going down. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And God is going, there's some destructive things coming in this world um, because it's just not going to survive. And we need to get focused on making a rapture. Can we say amen? Because you do not want to be left down here. We're going to cover some scriptures and show you that uh, as, as what lies ahead. So these things that we see, the violence, the poverty, the disease, the famine, the um, deficit, the oppression of the poor, the lack of medical for the elderly, all these things that are going on in the world is going to come to a climax to where it's actually going to break the world's economy. And that's what's going on. Now, but what's holding things back from getting worse than what they already are is the church. All right, so 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse number 1. All right, now I'm going to have to finish this, so we're going to have to move pretty quickly. So I won't be cracking as many jokes tonight because I want, I want you to get this. So, all right, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, let's read. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, and by our gathering together unto him. That's the rapture, okay? The ra our gathering together unto him is the rapture. Verse 2, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter as from us, as that the day of Christ is what? Now, the day of Christ, that's the rapture, the coming of the Lord. Now, if it was at hand 2,000 years ago, then what, it is, what is it today? He can come at any time. Is that right? Because this world is in such horrible shape. There's so much stuff going on. The devil, the God of this world, has his grip on the people in this world. To such a degree that things are a lot worse than we can ever imagine. Did you know that there is an epidemic of child sex slavery that's going on in our world? Shocking. Children being kidnapped, put into prostitution. Little boys kidnapped, put into prostitution. And the poverty is so great that in some parts of Africa, they found that a third of the top soil of the earth in certain places of Africa is gone. And they couldn't figure out what, what happened to a third of the top soil of the ground where they found out that people are starving so that they're eating it, eating the dirt. That's the poverty that's going on in this world. And uh, let's read verse number three. Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, what day? The coming of the Lord, the rapture, that day shall not come except there come a what? Falling away first. We are in that falling away now. What is the falling away? People leaving the church. People backsliding. People walking away. And of course, they're not backsliding today like they did in yesteryear. Um, they're backsliding in their ways. And I was talking to one sister that came to me and said that um, she wanted my blessings because she was leaving. Pray for her to find another church. I said, I'm not doing anything like that. I said, you out of line. That's not, that's not proper. She said, well, why not? I said, because 
We don't turn sheep loose like wild goats. She said, well, any other pastor said that, uh, 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 said God bless you. And, and I said, well, in case you didn't realize, I'm not like every other pastor. I said, Jesus said that if a man has a hundred sheep and one leaves the 99 and goes out away from the fold, he called it a lost sheep. And so a sheep is the most helpless creature out of all of God's creation. They have no means of protection from the wolves. They have no sense of being able to find food or to find water. That's the job of the shepherd. The shepherd's responsibility in the natural is to care for the sheep. He takes the sheep beside still waters so that they can drink because the way a sheep's nose is, if they try to drink from a running stream, that water will get in their nose and they will drown. He leaves them beside green pastures and he has to allow them to graze in those green pastures for so long Then he has to move them away with the staff to other areas because the sheep are so, um, and we say dumb for lack of a better word, that they will graze and graze and eat the roots and go all the way down to the dirt and keep on trying to eat because they are, they have no sense of protecting themselves or caring for themselves. So the shepherd has to know where to take them so that they can graze. When the infection gets in the nostrils of the sheep, because there could be bugs and parasites that get in the noses of the sheep and they have no sense of being able to care for themselves because they are the most helpless, dependent creatures out of all of God's creation, the shepherd then has to be able to discern that something is wrong with the sheep. He gets the oil and gets the ointment and puts it in the nose of the sheep to kill the parasites and the foreign uh, bugs and all that that could set up in their noses and cause them infections to die. You see, because we are human beings, God uses natural illustrations to show us how he deals with us spiritually. And that's why Jesus in 1 Peter chapter uh, 4, I think it is, he's called the chief shepherd. And if he is the chief shepherd, then the pastors are the under shepherds and the congregation is the fold individually. They are the sheep. And Israel's means, main means of occupation were shepherdizing. And so God uses what we are familiar with to teach us how he works spiritually. And so in the natural, if a lamb or a sheep cannot protect themselves from the wolves, if the wolves come, then the shepherd is there to protect them from the four-legged wolves because they have no means of self-preservation in and of themselves. They are just not made that way. You follow? Can we say amen? And that's why he compares his church, his people, to sheep. And he gives them pastors. The root word for pastor is shepherd. And the shepherd is the watchman of the sheep. In the natural, in Israel, they had upon the high towers of the city what they called watchmen. And what the watchman did was that the watchman constantly surveyed miles out from the city, from the tower, so that if the enemy would come and try to sneak upon them, the watchman can see them afar off and then warn the porters that were down below and then the porters will then go to the elders and say the enemy is coming. They will sound the trumpet and the people can prepare that they would not be destroyed. 
That's why the pastor, the New Testament pastor, is called the watchman because we look out and can see the enemy, the devil, from afar off, and then we come in and warn the sheep so that the sheep can get ready, and then they say, I don't want to hear what the pastor's saying. Why is he saying that he's picking on me? You see, so God uses things that we are familiar with to teach us how he works. Can we say amen? And so understand then that... Uh, Jesus used the example that if a sheep wanders away from the fold and if the shepherd doesn't go out and find them, they will fall prey to the wolves. They will either starve to death because they cannot know how to hunt for food. They will die of thirst because they don't know how to find the still waters. They are out there on their own. So I told this sister, I said, if you leave this church searching for another church, then you don't have a pastor. You don't have a shepherd. Therefore, then you are a lost what? And how can anybody be saved if they are lost sheep? Jesus came to save the lost. Can we say amen? Not to come and save us. We were lost and he gets saved and then we get lost again. So I said, I'm not releasing you. I said, now, if you don't want to be here, that's fine, because it ain't hurting my feelings. I don't want nobody here that don't want to be here. Can you say amen? But I have to do my job as a pastor still. That don't absolve me of doing my job as a pastor. So I, as I let the person know, I said, you can still be considered a member here until you find another place, because you cannot be without a pastor. Well, I thought that it was based on relationship with God. You don't have a relationship with God without a pastor. That's impossible. You cannot, no more than you can live without breathing. You cannot survive without a pastor. Just like in the natural, if the sheep wanders from the fold, they're not gonna die within the next 15 minutes. But eventually, if they don't eat, if they don't drink, or if the wolf is out there, what's gonna happen to them? That's in the natural. And God uses natural illustrations to convey spiritual thoughts. That's why Jesus used a lot of parables. Because he was using things that they were familiar with to teach them something that was spiritual as to how he works. And so this is what people do today. They wander from church to church. They think that they can leave. Well, first of all, they know what's, they feel that they know what's best for themselves, which they don't. And they leave and go from church to church without a pastor, and all they are is lost sheep. Can we say amen? You either a sheep or a goat. You either are a saved sheep or you are a what? Lost sheep. Are you following me, what I'm saying? And so everybody's got to have a pastor. If you don't have a pastor, you can't make it. No more than the lamb or the sheep can survive out in the wilderness all by themselves. It's only going to be a matter of time that the wolf is going to come in and devour them. And the pastor's job then is to protect the sheep from the two-legged wolves. Can we say amen? That's why we teach you what we teach you. That's why we say what we say to warn you so that when you go out there and have to fight the devil, you got something to fight with. You got some discernment. So we have to tell it to you like a T.I. is. And sometimes we got to call names. Now, don't get mad at me calling names because Paul called names five times. And it's in the Bible. Can we say Amen. And generally when I call names, these folk ain't going to mess with me because they know what I'm saying is, and they don't want it to get out. You hear what I'm saying? So we don't do these things to slander folk. We have to warn the sheep because the devil is bold today, and we have to be just as bold for God. Is that right? You can't have the devil bold, and then we go cower in a corner somewhere. Oh, no. We have to be bold. So... Uh, we are in the falling away where people are leaving the church. They don't, they're not loyal to anybody. They bounce from church to church. They bounce from congregation to congregation. They bounce from pastor to pastor. Not loyal to anybody. They are lost sheep. And nobody is going to heaven. Lost. Well, that's where we're in. The falling away first. Let's read. 
and that man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition. Now, that's the Antichrist. Now, this is what we're going to talk about now. The Antichrist is the devil in human flesh. All right, let's read verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is what? Called God or that is worship. Now, that's what our society is doing now. They are opposing anything that God, that is of God, in and everything. Now, they have what is called secular humanism. Secular humanism is being taught in our universities. What is that? That is the de-emphasizing of God and the emphasizing of man. That's secular humanism. To, where, to the point to where they won't even say the name Jesus. Or even when you say God, they say the intelligent designer. And of course, uh, we are in a world to where anything that is of God is opposed. Is opposed. To the point to where you, they don't even want you saying uh, uh, a prayer at a high school football or basketball game. Because it may offend somebody. Well, what about me getting defended because they don't pray? But you see, it's the devil. Is that right? He's got a grip and he's tightening the grip and it is affecting uh, the church, is affecting God's people because that spirit is getting on God's people. The de-emphasizing of God and the emphasis being placed on me, what I want. I feel that I don't fit in. I feel that this ain't right. I feel, I, 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 the five eyes that the devil used in Isaiah chapter 14 that got him kicked out of heaven. And people are doing the same thing today. It's not all about us. Is that right? But society has placed the emphasis. You know, when this country was founded, it was founded on Judeo-Christian principles. And they set the laws up based on the Bible. Now they have thrown the Bible out. And that's why this country is suffering what is suffering today. Because when they passed those homosexual laws and took prayer out of schools and out and did, that's when ISIS and Al Qaeda and all these folk came in. And they're not going to be able to stop them because you can't stop the devil. America cannot stop the devil. Bush spent $10 trillion trying to fight ISIS and Al-Qaeda. They're still around, aren't they? You can't stop the devil. Only God can. And that's why this country is suffering what it is suffering today because it boasted at being a Christian country and it is the most godless country upon the face of the earth. Can we say amen? Well, um, so the Antichrist, when he comes, he opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple, showing himself that he is God. So when the Antichrist comes, he's going to eventually take over this entire world and demand everybody bow down and worship him. And already the spirit is in our society already because they don't want you praying and reading the Bible, showing the Bible. They don't even want you saying Merry Christmas. Am I telling the truth? So there are shades of it already going on. All right, verse five. Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I what? Told you these things, verse six. And now ye know what withholdeth that he might be what? Revealed in this time. So God is holding the devil back from doing what he really wants to do because the church is still in the earth and there are still people that God has in his mind to save. That's why as bad as this world is now, it is not as bad as it could be because he's got a leash on Satan right now as long as the church is here. But as soon as the church is gone, and we're going to show you that in 6th chapter of Revelation, you are not going to want to be here. All right? Verse number 7. Let's read. For the mystery of iniquity does what? Already work. That's one of the 11 mysteries spoken of in the scripture. The mystery of iniquity is already working. The works of the devil works in a manner that mystifies us. That is a mystery that people cannot readily acknowledge and see. 
It's the mystery of iniquity. It's already working. A lot of these things that are coming are already working. Mr. Iniquity don't already work. Let's read. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken what? Out of the way. Now, the word let and letteth. When the scriptures were translated out of the original language from 1604 and 1611, the words that they used, some of them don't mean the same thing that they mean today. In my library, I have over 800 words that are in the Bible that almost mean the complete opposite of what they mean today. One of those words is let. Now, let means to allow and permit. But back in those days when the scriptures were originally translated out of the original language, the word let meant, meant to hinder, to impede, to stop. So when you read the text, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work, only he, that's the church, who now hindereth, will hinder until he, the church, is what? Taken out of the way. So the church is hindering the mystery of iniquity from working fully. The God has a leash on Satan right now until the church is taken out of the way. So all of the things that you see going on in the world is nothing compared to when God takes the church out and he takes the leash off Satan. And there's going to be a time in this world that has never been. Well, uh, we, did, we read the rest of the day Bible class, so let's read verse number 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed. That's the Antichrist who will be the devil. And he's going to come out of Rome, Italy, and he's going to be a Roman Jew. And he's going to be the leader of Israel. And someone asked the question, what significance was when Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem? What that did was he chose a side because for decades the United States may remain somewhat neutral concerning the conflict between the Palestinians and the Israelis or Israel because the Palestinians want to be recognized as a sovereign country from Israel. And Israel saying we're all one. And so the United States remain kind of neutral at the same time trying to negotiate peace between the Palestinians and the Israelis. But because Trump moved the embassy to Jerusalem, he has now sided with Israel. And it's going to be very difficult for now America to negotiate peace in the Middle East. Because all he did was exacerbated everything and made everything worse. Well, it's got to happen because the world is going to be divided into three camps. According to the book of Daniel in the end. King of the north, which will be Russia. King of the south, which is the Arab nation and the beast. Where will the United States be? Well, Bush, uh, Trump already acknowledged, put the embassy in, in Jerusalem or Tel Aviv. Is, is it Tel Aviv? Jerusalem. So where is the United States going to be? They're going to be with the Antichrist. You don't want to be in this country. Can we say amen? All right. Well, let's read on. Um, then that wicked shall be revealed whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming. When God comes down as Jesus Christ and destroys the Antichrist, puts an end to man's government and set up his own kingdom in the earth. Uh, that's the brightness of his coming. Verse 9. Even him, that's the Antichrist, whose coming is after the working of who? The Satan. That's because he's going to be Satan. Just as Jesus was God in the human body, the devil's going to be the Antichrist in the human body. Even him whose coming is after the working of Satan with all what? Power, signs, and what kind of wonders? Did you not know that the devil can work some wonders? When the Antichrist comes, he's going to be working Miracles, he's going to be doing things that no other, no other man ever done. And why is it that every time something miraculous happens, we think it's God? Oh, the devil can do some things too. He can work some wonders, but you know what kind of wonders they are? Lying wonders to deceive. And that's what he's going to be doing. So a lot of these people run to these, all these conferences and all this kind of stuff claiming that they got healed. God ain't healing all these folk. The devil can heal too. Read the 13th chapter of Revelation. The beast whose deadly wound was healed. The devil can heal too. The devil can imitate almost anything God can do. 
with the exception of raising the dead. The devil can fake speaking in tongues. I've heard it. Have you ever heard the devil speak in tongues? I mean, we was working with my brother-in-law, and uh, we baptized him. He just got out of prison, and I went, we get the Holy Ghost. He started speaking. I said, that's it, that's it. I thought it was the Holy Ghost. Until they brought him to church. A few days later, he's foaming at the mouth, demon-possessed. And we, my, myself, Bishop Combs, and Bishop Tim Johnson, of course, we weren't bishops at that time. We were just teenagers uh, uh, and, and uh, um, uh, young men in the ministry. We was on a three-day fast, and we was working with my brother-in-law, and that demon lifted him up out the chair. <laughs> I'm telling you. But the name Jesus, that's why I love that name. Cast that demon out of him, and... God filled him with the real Holy Ghost. Lived a little time and backslid. So, but the devil can imitate. The devil can heal. The devil has power. He can heal. Is that right? Yes, he can. You know. But people think that just because everybody gets healed, that it's God. It ain't all God now. Well, that's another subject. But anyway, uh, he says, uh, line wonders, verse 10, and with all what? deceivableness of what? Unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they what? If you don't love this truth, the devil's going to get you. He says with all deceivableness, look at that, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness. In other words, there is a deceptive component to unrighteousness. That's why unrighteousness is very dangerous because when a child of God is unrighteous they make themselves susceptible to deception when you are unrighteous. When we're not doing what the Bible says we're supposed to do, doing what we know we're supposed to do we are unrighteous and there is a deceptive component to unrighteousness. And a person gets to the point to where they are unrighteous and think they are right. Won't pay tax, but they think they are right. Won't live right, but they think they are right. Can cuss and drink and do all of this stuff and think they're unright. What has happened? Their unrighteousness has tricked them into thinking that they're right when they're wrong. That's the danger of unrighteousness. And what's going to be the end? They're going to perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be what? Say, that's the danger for rejecting truth because if we reject truth, there's nothing else but deception. That's all there is. If I don't want God, the only alternative is who? The devil. If I don't want to be saved, the only alternative is what? To be lost. And rejecting truth as it is taught you in Bible class. As you are preached to from the pulpit. Rejecting that. Discounting, oh, that's just the pastor. He just talking. I don't agree with all that. Better be careful because that's how it starts. And a person wind up being wrong and don't know that they're wrong. That's the deceivableness of unrighteousness. And we're running out of time. All right? Uh, and them that perish because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Verse 11. And for this cause God shall do what? Send them a what? Strong delusion that they what? Isn't that something that if I'm not living according to how I know I'm supposed to live and being unrighteous and so full of myself, God will send me a lie to believe. And if God sends a lie for you to believe, you cannot believe nothing else. In Isaiah 66 and 4, he said, I will choose their delusions. See, that's the side of God that folk don't like to talk about, but it's just, just as much as of him. Why would God give me a strong delusion to believe a lie? Verse 12, that they all might be damned who what? Believe not the truth, but had pleasure in what? Or were satisfied doing whatever they wanted to do. Because that's the day we're living in. People want to do what they want to do. Like the songwriter said, it's your thing. Do what you. I won't tell you who to sock it to. Well, Jesus is going to sock it to him. Is that right? I said I'm not going to be cracking no jokes, but there it is. 
So the church is holding things back. Revelation chapter 6. We're running out of time. Revelation chapter 6. Let's show you what, what's coming. The rich are getting richer. The poor. Is, the rich is eating lamb under glass. The poor is eating bread. Rich are getting richer. Poor are getting poorer. Now, this is the beginning of the tribulation period. And the church at this time has been taken out of the way. And now God has taken the leash off of the devil. And you'll see what he's doing. Now, what we're going to read is what Bible theologians call the, force men, the four men of the apocalypse. There is no four men of the apocalypse. It's one man riding four horses and we're going to explain it as we get into it all right and if you don't get it all tonight i encourage you to get the cd it's a very nominal fee or watch it on on the facebook or youtube verse number one let's read and i saw when the lamb opened one of the seals now this is jesus christ as the lamb of god the seals is the judgments of god that he is pronouncing on the world because now the church is gone and now his wrath is starting all right. One of the seals, let's read. And I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder. One of the four beasts saying, come in what? See, now the four beasts is symbolic of the glorified church. And so this is one of the saints that is showing John in this vision what's going to be in the earth once the church is taken out of the way. All right. Verse number two. And I saw and behold a white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow. Now, the him is the Antichrist. Horse is symbolic of power. See, under your hood, you have so many horsepower under your hood of your car. So horse is symbolic of power. White is symbolic of purity. So what John is seeing is the Antichrist coming into prominence in his power and his purity. He's not coming in demanding folk to bow down and worship him. He's coming in in a manner that is appealing to the world. That's how he gets control. So he is riding a white horse. He is coming in his purity and power to take control of the world because he's coming in a manner that is peaceable. Daniel said he comes in by flatteries. He comes in with the answers to the world's problems. He comes in settling the conflict in the Middle East. He comes in getting Israel their land back or the, to, to, to rebuild their temple, to reestablish, reestablish their worship, their burning of sacrifices. He's coming in in a peaceable manner, making people think that he is all for their good. He's riding a white horse. You follow? Let's read. And he had, a, and he had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth doing what? Conquering and conquering. This is what he's doing. He's going to uh, be conquering, but he is not going to reveal himself. Now, as we read on, he's going to change horses, which means as time goes on, he's going to be revealing more and more of himself, and you will see the condition that will be going on in the earth at that time. Let's, white horse, he coming in by flatteries. Verse number three. And when he had opened the second seal, that's the lamb, I heard the second beast say what? Come and see. And there went out uh, another horse that was red. This represents bloodshed. So now as time, as the tribulation period progresses, now he is changing horses. Now he is causing bloodshed. Let's read. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take what? Peace from the earth and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a what? So he is going to take peace out of the earth. There will be no more peace in the entire world at that time. Now, as bad as it is, as bad as Louisville is, is record number of homicides, record number of homicides unsolved. Kentucky has the highest state of overdoses in any other state in the United States. We have more children being raised by grandparents in this state more than any other state. 
We have homeless in this state that is of great proportions that rivals other states. Police force, I was talking to a police officer friend of mine and he said they are 150 officers short. And he said, and that doesn't include the 50 that is retiring this year. And we are all at peace tonight sitting here, but what will it be when the devil gets on the red horse and takes peace out of the earth? Why? Because the church is gone. You better be with me in the rapture because that's where I'm going. Do not want to be here. Well, let's read on. Take peace from the earth and that they should do what? Kill one another. And there was given unto him a what? Great sword. Let's read verse 5. When they opened the third seal, I heard the third be say, come and see. And I beheld a lo a black horse. Now, this is what we want to get to. This is why we talked about the economy and how much money our government is spending and wasting and how this country is going to come to a economic collapse. The world financial system is going to collapse because when the beast comes on the black horse, he's going to bring famine. Let's read. And I beheld and lo, a black horse and he that sat on him had a what? Parent balance is that that's rationing. Now, in World War II, everything was rationed. Food was rationed. Clothes was rationed. Sugar was rationed. Tires were rationed. Bishop Paddock said he used to have to use uh, uh, three spare tires just to get to church because tires were rationed. Back in those days. In those days, if you wanted to get milk or food, you had to get a, a book of stamps. And a lot of saints thought that that was the mark of the beast. And so many of the saints would not go down to get the stamps, but they were using the other saints' stamps. <laughs> but that's what they were going on. So our society, our water is becoming more polluted. They said the earth is running out of fresh drinking water. And our food is so polluted with so much pesticides and stuff and all these other kinds of things. And the earth is running out of what we need to produce it, to produce our survival. Well, in this time, famine is coming. There's already famine in the world today, but this is worldwide famine. Who's gonna do this? The beast riding the black horse. All right, let's read on. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Verse 6. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the what? Oil and the wine. So there's going to be a lack of food in the earth. Now, I remember when Israel were cut off by their enemy. They had no means of providing for themselves because the enemy had cut the city off. And they had got so hungry that... Uh, an ass's head, a donkey's head was sold for so many pieces of silver. They were eating the donkey's heads. And they were eating calves, uh, uh, doves' dung. You know what doves' dung is, don't you? That's how bad it got. And one of the kings was there at the time, and he said a woman, uh, the scripture says a woman yelled at him and said, King, I got a problem. My neighbor is not treating me right. He said, what's going on? Well, she had a baby and I had a baby, and uh, uh, she said, let's eat your baby today so we can have some food to eat. And we ate our baby, and now she won't give up her baby so that we can eat. The Bible said the king just fell out. But it's going to be worse than that. When he takes the church out of the earth and let the devil run wild for, for, for a little while. Famine. All right. Verse number seven. When I opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth be say what? Come and see. Verse eight. And I looked and behold a what? Pale horse. So now, <laughs> so as the Antichrist shows his true colors, it, you see what the earth, what is being produced in the earth. All right. Pale horse, that's three. And his name that, that son on him was death, and hell followed him. And what was the result? And power was given unto him, unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and with what? 
because there's going to be so lack of food and starvation, the animals are going to be going wild. And the animals are going to turn because they need to eat. <laughs> now, I don't have any pets because I don't trust them. <laughs> I don't trust no pets. I remember one of my deacons in Michigan wanted me to go pray for his aunt or somebody. And we walked in the house, and she had some pet birds. And I walked in there, and birds was flying all over the place. I was ducking. I said, what in the world is going on? Then he took me in the back room, and, you know, his uh, aunt, she was in her 90s, and she had no clothes on her. I said, Doc, cover, the, cover your aunt up, man. You want me to pray for her? She ain't got no clothes on? Birds flying all around. <laughs> I went in there and said, in the name of Jesus. Help her, Lord. Help her, Lord. Walked out, birds flying all around. I'm ducking and carrying on. I said, brother, don't you ever do nothing like this to me. But I thought about the tribulation period. You see all these hawks that fly around, these eagles, and all of these birds. Remember that movie, The Birds, Alfred Hitchcock? They said that Hitchcock was sexually harassing uh, Tippi Hedren, and she would not receive his advances and so what he did he unleashed real birds when you saw her in that phone booth he unleashed real birds starred her for the rest of her life you ought to read her biography sometime and a lot of those birds were real and a lot of those cuts were real you check it out because Hitchcock was a pervert <laughs> said I don't folk ain't safe in Hollywood Oh, they, they love the Lord. They don't love the Lord. They love the, the God. They love themselves. You know, praise the Lord. So, but, but the thing of it is, is that you see all these animals. Now, when I'm in the Dominican, there's such impoverished over there that you see dogs that you ain't never seen in that condition. You see cats in a condition that you've never seen. And I remember they had one of some, some of the dinners that they had for us because I taught a four-hour Bible class and they sent out for food and they brought the food in and I was eating the food and I was eating the chicken and they had some other kind of uh, banana, fried banana stuff, whatever that stuff is, and the dogs was walking around and I threw the banana out there and the dog just looked at it and looked at me. He's like, oh, what is this? I ain't eating this. I said, as hungry as that dog, he ain't even going to eat it. So I just gave the dog some of the chicken. He said, now you're talking now. <laughs> Lord have mercy. But can you imagine this time? That's why we should have the mindset that any little differences we have with each other ain't about nothing. Can we say amen? <laughs> that because uh, when you think about what's coming, because it's coming, you know, then your perspective should change. Like, you know what? I got to get up out of here. I'm going to do everything that God told me to do. I'm going to sacrifice whatever I got to sacrifice and whatever I got to do without, I'm going to do without. If I get my feelings hurt, they're going to have to be hurt. I'd rather have my feelings hurt than my soul lost. Because this is many folk, this is going to happen to people. It's already starting with our deficit. It's already starting with injustices in our court system. It's already starting with uh, pedophilia running rampant, sex trafficking, poverty, disease, and all those other kinds of stuff is already happening. Folks sleeping with strangers, you don't know what they got. They look one way on the outside, you don't know what they got. Can we say amen? <laughs> All kinds of stuff going on in this world. Well, we're going to stop here, and you read the rest of it in your spare time. But this is what's coming. And this is us discerning the signs of the times. God is talking to us through these things that are going on in the world to let us know we need to get, if we're not serious, we need to get serious. We need to get down to the business of saving our soul because it's coming down the pipe. Because God would not have taken out time to show this apostle these visions in his prison cave and it not happen. 
Can you say amen? Well, we're going to close. That's all the time we have. We could go a little more, but we just wanted to show you um, where we are headed. And we should be focused on saving ourselves. Are there any questions tonight? Yes, sir, Elder Smith. Matthew 25 and 32. All right. Matthew 25 and 32. And before him shall be gathered all nations, and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divided his sheep from the goats. Your question, sir. Can this be a type of today as the pastor being a shepherd? Today's church. Well, well, actually, well, in the church, there are sheep and uh, goats. There are in the church. And the word of God uh, distinguishes between the two. So from the standpoint of what I believe you're asking is that uh, it is revealed to some degree in our churches, those that are God's sheep and those that are goats, and the goats are those that rebel against the shepherd of the flock. So to some degree, there is a separation um, that does happen, and that lesson is demonstrated, uh, I think, in the parable of the tares and the wheat to some degree, uh, and the chaff and the wheat. Because everybody that is in the church uh, is not going to make it. And Jesus said in the 10th chapter of St. John, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That indicates two things, that there are some that are of his sheep, and there are some that are not of his sheep. All in the same house, but everybody is not of his sheep. So... The word of God does divide. And at this time, this is the ultimate separation that will take place. All right? I hope that helps some. All right. Anybody else? Yes, ma'am. Revelation 6, yes. Well, that is true. We are seeing the previews of these things. This is why we have to discern the times to know that we're getting close. With the um, um, lack of health care, lack of food, poverty, disease, crime, murder, uh, and all these type of things, there are these, there, there is shades of these happening right now. That is true. And so God has given us these signs to be able to tell us to get ready. It's going to be happening. Get ready and stay ready. So yes, and this is what we're talking about tonight. All of the things that are going on in the world now is like Elder Larry Smith uh, made the point sometime about when um, the president put the embassy in, is it Jerusalem? See, the countries are lining up because as we get closer to the rapture, groups are going to be grouping up 
to the point to where in the book of Daniel, the world is going to be divided into three camps. All of the nations are going to be divided into three camps. The king of the north, which is Russia, the king of the south, which is the Arab nations, and the beast. The beast will be the leader of Israel. And the United States is Israel's biggest ally. So by him moving that embassy there, thing, people are li things are lining up and to the point to where there's going to be three camps. All the nations are going to be divided into three camps. And as eventually those three camps are going to come to try to fight against God when he comes down from heaven because they're going to um, try to destroy Israel in the end because the Antichrist is going to turn on Israel. And that's when the Lord's going to come and save that remnant that refused to follow the Antichrist to give Israel another chance. You see, Jesus, when he came, he only came to two tribes. How many tribes of Israel was there? Twelve. He only came to two. So there has to be a second coming of Christ to give the rest of Israel an opportunity to be saved. And that's what Paul said, all Israel shall be saved. Not every single Israelite, but there will be Israelites saved out of all 12 tribes. That's why it's called the second coming, to give Israel another chance. Our chance is now. If we don't make it now with all that we have, that's it for us. <laughs> and that's why I'm doing all that I can to make sure that we make it. Yes, sir. That's true, uh, it's a good point, because they got, they got to pay for it somewhere. They got to pay for it. Now, to give you some idea of how corrupt this government is, uh, there is no law that says you have to pay taxes on your wages. There is no law, I'm telling you. But Woodrow Wilson, got back in the teens, got with some of the House representatives and passed this uh, tax, this, this thing to tax wages. In the IRS code, the only taxes that's supposed to be taken out is off of capital gains and investments because your wage is your agreement with the employer that I'm going to give you my time and then you pay me for my time. And there is no law that states that you have to pay taxes on your income. But that goes to show how corrupt the government is because if you don't pay, what are they gonna do to you? And there have been people that have challenged that law and have one in the courts because a crime is when you break the law. And if you have not broken the law, then how can you be com considered committing a crime? But the government is so corrupt that they will take your money and dare you to fight against them and lock you up and take everything you got. Now I remember one year, I'm gonna tell you this, a little personal, I remember one year that General Electric, and I remember this, and I'll tell you why. General Electric made $300 million worth of profit one year and didn't pay a dime of taxes because they took advantage of all the loopholes and sent their money overseas. How I remember that? Because the government, because the IRS audited me and I was making $62,000 a year and said that I owed them $8,800. <laughs> and 
And I went to a tax attorney and said, man, what is this? He said, if the IRS say you owe, pay it. I said, when I got all this, if, he said, did you hear what I said? So I had to pay. So I made a arrangement. He said, you better make arrangement or something with them. Thank God they didn't come after the church because I didn't want that to happen. So I took the hit. And so I made agreement to pay him $148 a month. But I remember, because that was the same year that General Electric didn't pay a dime. I paid more money than General Electric made, pay, and they made $300 million. You don't think I'm waiting on the rapture? <laughs> you don't think I'm going to go see Jesus? Now, that's something personal. And it went all over the world. But so what? The IRS already know about it. You know? And, and I just got a tax bill the other day. It said I owe $51. Now, when I did my taxes, they said I owe $850-something. And I had my son file an extension. You know those extensions they give you to October? I said, we don't care nothing about that. You was $21 short, and we're going to tack on another $30 penalty. We want our money. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to give them their money. Well, it's already happening. It's happening right here in Louisville. You know, a, good, a good friend of mine is a police officer. Uh, they're, 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 they're over 100 officers short. And I remember I called. We had some uh, uh, homeless people out here. One was giving me some lip. And, uh, you know, the devil said, get at him. I said, no, I'm going to call the police. Called the police. And uh, they didn't show up. Of the guy left. I called the police and blasted him on the phone. And the sergeant, I said, let me talk to the sergeant. I said, look, man. You know, and let him have it. He said, um, Reverend, we only got two cops patrolling the hall of Louisville. <laughs> I said, two cops? <laughs> he, said, <laughs> he said, we only got two, we only got two cars out there. Well, what can we do? I said, well, he gone now. I said, well, I might kick him next time he don't move. I'm just letting you know. And we started laughing. So it's already happening, Elder Rowe. It's already happening. Not just in this city, but in what? They better put, we better look to Jesus. Is that right? They better look to Jesus because police will show up after it's over. And I've seen it happen in, in Bay City. You call them, they'll wait till it's all over, then they show up. What's going on? Nothing. <laughs> all right, let's take a offering. <laughs> Nothing going on.